You may proceed. Well, thank you. Good morning. I'm Steve Emmert, and along with Govan Sethi and Sam Sled, I represent the victim of a seven time drunk driver in this personal injury case. As I mentioned in my notice of appearance last week, I propose to address the court's question dealing with the date of entry of the final order in the case, and Mr. Sethi will deal with the substantive issues on remitted. There are probably a three step analysis that will answer the court's question, and I think conclusively give you the answer of yes to your question. The correct date for measuring the filing deadlines is February 28th. First is a visit to Hutchins v. Talbert, which was the most recent case in which this court addressed the effect of a suspension order. There was a suspension order, as a matter of fact, exactly the same kind of suspension order in this case, along with the original final order entered in January. That suspended the final judgment for 14 days, giving the parties a total of 35 days. That procedure was specifically approved by this court in the Hutchins case. Within that time, on February 8th, the court entered what I'll call a handwritten order, because most of it is in handwriting on a form, that affirmatively amended the original order by granting a motion for remitted of punitive damages in this whole complaint, down from $100,000 to $50,000. That order was not complete in terms of the statutory requirements for remitted to it, because it did not specify the choice that the plaintiff had, either to accept it, accept it under protest and appeal, or reject it and have it be withdrawn. So in that sense, it wasn't a complete recitation of what the court had to do within a remitted to motion. Within 20 days thereafter, and I suppose I should stop before saying that, under Hutchins, that would have been the final order, even though I don't believe that there was something that wasn't done under the statute. However, within 20 days thereafter, which is timely, of course, the court entered a further amended order on the 28th of February. That's different in a number of respects, but two of them are meaningful here and are dispositive. The first is that the court did indeed address the question of what the plaintiff's choice was. It recited that the plaintiff had a right to accept the remitted to order under protest, thus bringing about today's appeal. That wasn't contained in the previous order. It was only contained in the February 28th order. In the very next sentence, the court also specified the date for the beginning of running a post-judgment interest, which may sound a minor issue, but in this case, where you have a jury verdict upon which the final judgment was not based, the judgment was based upon the judge's ruling, then you'd have an open question as to what date the court intended for that. And in this February 28th order, the court specified that it intended interest to run back from February 28th. The last step in our journey, then, is Rule 5, colon 5B, which specifically provides for a situation like this. The two sentences that are relevant say that the time for filing a notice is not extended by the filing of a motion unless the final judgment is modified, et cetera. And then it says, in such a case, the time for filing the notice shall be computed from the date of final judgment entered following such modification. The original judgment order in January was modified timely on February 8th, and that order was meaningfully modified timely on February 28th. That means that the notice of appeal and the petition for appeal are timely. At this point, I'd like to... I have just one... Go ahead. I'm not getting away from the question. I have just one question for you, Mr. Emmett. On that February 8th order, the court says the court's ruling is incorporated into this order. I think that's what it says. The N, I think, is a typo in handwriting. Yes, ma'am. But if the February 28th order, or the February 8th order incorporated the first order, the January order, then it would include the interest and all the other language except the plaintiff's options with regard to remediator. So why wouldn't that be an order that adjudicates the principles of the cause, has all the terms in it, because it incorporates the first order and therefore be the final order? First, the January order does not contain any provision for interest. It doesn't address it at all. It's on pages 93 and 94. It says that there's no award of pre-judgment interest, but it doesn't address post-judgment interest. Okay. And second, it does clearly specify the plaintiff's rights when it comes to the brand new development of remediator. And that's clearly not provided in any of the prior orders. Counsel, I have a hypothetical for you. Let's say, instead of what happened in this case, that the trial judge made the same offer, suspended the order for 14 days, gave them an additional 21 days. On the 34th day, the parties produced an order that was identical to the final order that was entered on the original date. 
In that case, I don't think that that would be, that would suspend it because... Under our precedent, then, the parties would have waived their right to appeal because the 30 days would have elapsed, wouldn't it? Quite probably. Uh, because it, it would not... Well, let me think back on that because I know that if the order that is ultimately entered does not modify it, then that doesn't suspend the, the running. That's Rule 5, Code 5. But now that I think about it, I, the suspension of the suspension order in this case would have postponed, I think, all appellate deadlines by at least 14 days. We've never said that, I don't think. Have we? I, I think that's necessarily the case when when the court does enter a suspension order, because even in, in Hutchins, it says once the order uh, expires on May 9th, for example, in the, in the Hutchins case, once the order expires, that triggers the running of appellate deadlines. That was a specific holding in, in Hutchins. I think the answer is you don't waive it by doing that. So well, another way to look at this, look at Hudgens, narrow Hudgens a little bit to say that it just applies to a situation when um, that later order denies a motion to to, uh, to modify, because that relates right back to five A, doesn't it? I think five five A. I think it does. Okay. Council, can you give me a definition of the word modify in that rule that you would use that's consistent with your position that this is a modification? I'm not sure if I would go as far as to say correction of a typographical error in the spelling of the uh, or something like that would be necessarily the case. Where there's a, a meaningful change, I think it does. I don't know, I don't have here, standing here. A, okay, but the two things that you listed are not changes. I think they are. Actually, I think they are changes because the first question, but let me go to the second question. It's a very open-ended question of whether the post-judgment interest is going to run from the date of the verdict or when the judgment is based upon a judge's ruling, whether it's based upon that order. But again, it's not a meaningful change. It wasn't in it in the first one to begin with. Well, if it's not present, present in something in the earlier order, but it's now added to this, to this order, I think that is a modification because it adds something meaningful. The other one is pr- providing the, the missing statutory requirement. And if the original well, order does and, and Okay, and on the statutory requirement, whether it's in the order or not, it's a statutory requirement. It is, but the earlier order didn't purport to give the plaintiff any of those choices. It just said remitted or is ordered. It didn't specify those. It also didn't specify what the plaintiff elected. And if the plaintiff had elected in that case, I want a new trial, then none of this would be final. So there has to be a point at which there's something that seals the finality of this, and that's what I think this final order was. I'm criminally overlong in moving the podium to Mr. <laughs> Seller. Oh. No, 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 sorry. He, he, they're not finished. They're splitting their opening time. Good morning. They're splitting their opening time. Mr. Emmert was taking up a discrete issue. Good morning. The, the question presented by this appeal is whether the remitter of Ms. Colson's award of punitive damages from 100000 to, uh, to 50000 was appropriate. The court in Polston and, and in the Baldwin case <coughs> has established five markers or guideposts that it looks at to determine whether a remitter is appropriate or not. So I will try to just quickly go through those because I think that governs uh, the issues in this case or whether the remitter was appropriate. The first one I think uh, potentially most relevant in this case is whether um, the court looks at the punishment that is required. And if you look at this case, the record, the trial record is filled with Mr. Canchola's egregious conduct, uh, which includes operating a motor vehicle with a BAC of .15 or greater, driving without a valid operator's license, driving while being deemed a habitual offender, uh, fleeing the scene of an accident where bodily injury occurred, and driving knowing he had multiple DUI convictions and having been at least required to take one ASAP course. Here we're not punishing Mr. Canchola for any prior conduct, we're punishing him for his knowledge. His knowledge at the time he hit the Polson vehicle that he had these prior convi- DUI convictions, that he was uh, required to enroll in a course, and he knew that while operating the vehicle. Counsel, let me, let me ask you a question and, and so jump ahead a little bit. This, this case has been teed up in a very interesting way, and I think it's really narrows it down to whether proportionality is something that should con- control the decision. Do you want to talk about that? Yes, I will. I'll, I'll go to that now, which I think is the way the trial court ultimately came down. If you look at the end of the, the February 8th hearing, basically the, I think the court said was that it didn't want to keep a ratio above 10 to 1. Um, this court has not heard a punitive's case where the ratio was above uh, 10 to 1, but we do know there's, and we cited in our brief, two circuit court cases at least where, a uh, case in Fairfax, uh, and of course a case out in the city of Portsmouth, which have held ratios of 1 to 20 and 1 to 41. Um, there is no bright line rule, and I think that's really the precedent. If there's anything that we could take from these courts' prior decisions in Colston and Baldwin, it's just that. You have to look at these cases 
case by case. You've got to look at the facts. In this case, we have seven DUIs. In another case, you may have two DUIs. We also had a BAC issue. So in terms of the proportionality, it's one of the factors we look at, but there's absolutely nothing in this court's jurisprudence to indicate that there is a bright line rule. There just isn't that in what we see. And I think if the court reverses the trial court and holds that the $100,000 jury award for punitives is correct or upholds it, it would just be following its prior precedent, which says you have to look at each case based on the facts of that specific case. So I hope I've addressed your question with the proportionality. You started to. I think that's probably going to be most of your focus of your argument, I guess, isn't it? Yes. Well, it is. And I think that when you... But isn't the issue here is if the purpose behind it is to punish, it's the same conduct. What difference does it make? And that's the whole point. Proportionality starts to go by the wayside if what you're talking about is the jury decided this conduct is punishable by $100,000 in this case. Why is it not punishable by $100,000 in this case? Isn't that the strongest argument? Oh, it is. I mean, I'm addressing... I was just trying to address... I was trying to get you to where he's at. Right. If you look at the jury instruction, the issue is just to punish Mr. Canchola and deter him and others from engaging in this conduct. And a jury, after seeing or hearing the evidence for three days, indicated that in this specific case, $100,000 was the appropriate amount. So when you look at the factors, there's obviously an interplay between proportionality and the amount of punishment. And it's a reasonable factor to have proportionality because this court has to regulate to make sure a jury doesn't do something completely out of proportion, which we do know from one circuit court case, the domestic assault case in the city of Portsmouth, which we cited, where it was $600 of compensatory damages. The jury came back with $150,000 punitives. So their proportionality may play a role because all the factors have to... There's an interplay there. But there's nothing egregious in this particular case based on these facts of having a $100,000 reward. Frankly, when we got the verdict, we thought it was low. So where did the trial judge go wrong? By just basing his whole decision on the proportionality and forgetting the other four factors? That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. I think in this case, the trial court, as it said at the end of the hearing, that if the judge had not reduced it, he thought it would have been reversed by this court. But if you look at all the factors that are important, and you can even look at the other two, which are really not relevant, I guess, here. There was the issue of... It may come up the issue of the defendant's ability to pay. All we know is that Mr. Canchola, and it was admitted at trial that he was incarcerated. But this is important. He denied through the course of the trial that he was operating the vehicle. Now imagine that. You have seven prior DUIs. There's somebody following you, and he denies operating it. Wouldn't that exacerbate or upset a jury to say there's no accountability there? If he's not even admitting he's driving the vehicle, well, you've got to up the punishment then because he's not accounting for his own conduct. He's taking no responsibility for it. And there was no evidence on the ability to pay, but I mentioned that as a factor because of the incarceration issue. And then in terms of the double recovery, I don't think that's really that relevant in this case either because I think the jury obviously understood the compensatory awards where you had specials of about $3,000 versus the punitive awards. Well, suppose the jury thought that they ought to have $200,000 altogether and they just divided it between the two. You don't know what they did one way or the other. So you don't know whether it's double or whether it's compensatory. You have no idea whether it's a double burden. So, by the way, that's a friendly question. But on the verdict sheet, they gave the compensatory awards and they identified the amount and they identified the amount of the punitive. So in this case, they have a companion case and they awarded the same amount in that. And I think there's a very colorful argument that had they come out with less punitives for Ms. Colson and more for Mr. Stamke, that would have been more arbitrary than this award because if the real focus, as you said, Justice Lemons, is to punish and to deter, then you really should punish and deter for this conduct and to prevent future conduct. And the conduct was the same for both the occupant of the vehicle and the passenger and the driver. I'd like to reserve my remaining time for rebuttal. All right. Thank you. Good morning. If it pleases the Court, my name is Steve Bancroft. I'm here on behalf of the appellee, Victor Canchola. In answering the first question and the question that was posed by this Court concerning the various orders that were entered in this particular case, it is the contention of 
Mr. Canchola that the order that controls this case is the second order uh, that was entered by judge uh, by the trial court uh, on February 8. If we look at what the trial court did, after the jury verdict was entered, we had a final order that set forth what that verdict was. By statute, post-trial interest starts running at that time. You don't have to incorporate that into the order to have it complete. By statute, that interest starts running. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Bancroft. If what you say is correct, the final order now is not in one order. It's now a combination of two or more orders. That, it, it, that, I agree. I think that's what we've got. So here's is what that, happened. Is case law that, that well, recognizes that? No, all I can tell you, Judge, is, is, is that the way this court has analyzed other cases, when we look at the, the thing that makes this unique is, is that this is a consolidated case. There was actually two cases within this one. Because when we look at what when we look at what the original order says, it sets forth the compensatory damages for both Mr. Stemke and Ms. Colson. It sets forth the punitive damage award for both. The issues concerning the compensatory awards were never raised on any post-trial motions. There was the issues were solely on the punitive issue. When we argued that on February 8th in the trial court, denied the ruling as it re my request for remitted or as it relates to Mr. Stemke, then that, that order right there uh, is the final say concerning Mr. Stemke. Okay, I understand. Let me, let me tell you what my problem is. And, and you and I both did some things in Northern Virginia, have done some things in Northern Virginia. And the practice up there is on these very busy motions days very frequently to enter a sort of an interim order that's not really intended to be a final order. And the judge says, I really want this to be in a, in a proper form, but if you don't do anything after a certain number of days, it's going to be final. Well, let me ask you the same hypothetical I asked uh, Mr. Emmert. Is the trial court setting you up to, to in effect, waive uh, your right to an appeal if you, if you enter a final order on 34 days that really uh, just formalizes what was done earlier? Well, I mean, I, I think that's, I don't think anybody's setting anyone up, but I think... And not intentionally, I thought no. that inadvertently, yeah. Right. But, right, I think inadvertently, this case, uh, there may have been, I think the trial court's intention was to try to uh, quantify or put this whole thing together, but in reality... You get a final order that really takes care of everything and, and, dis and disposes of the case, right? But, but in reality, part of that was a complete nullity because the 21 days had already run under Rule uh, 1 colon 1 and uh, Rule 5 colon 5 had already kicked in so that you'd already missed it. Yeah. So, uh, so, so my position is, is that that original order on, on January 11... Let's say that, let me just change this slightly. Let's say that you wanted to appeal. You didn't like the way that things turned out. You'd have to file one notice of appeal for part of the case within a certain period of time and then wait for the other order to be final in the other part of the case, possibly. I, I, It'd be a real mess, too, wouldn't it? Well, I agree. Uh, but when we look at it uh, and we look at what, the, what this court said in, in uh, Talbert, I mean, it, it, again, we don't have a case where we've got consolidated cases in one where parts of the case were appealed and parts of the case were not appealed. Uh, that's what makes this somewhat unique and... and, and and Mr. Bancroft, you know, I, I think your argument depends on what the meaning of the third paragraph in the February 8th order is. And that, that third paragraph says the court's ruling is incorporated into this order. Now, what you're maintaining is that the court's ruling incorporates and includes the prior judgment award. Absolutely. Well, but see, that's contrary to everything I know about how Fairfax County and Arlington and Prince William does. Is this a, you know, when I saw this order, I said February 8th. I bet that was a Friday. And I went Absolutely. right to the calendar, and sure enough, it's a, it's Friday. a Friday. And you get five minutes to present an order, to make a brief argument, or whatever. The, the court's ruling is incorporated into this order, is the court's ruling of that day. Because it's something that maintains, people come back later on and say, well, Judge, you didn't say that. Well, Judge, you did say this. Well, what the court's doing is saying, the court's ruling is this, and I just wrote it down. So nobody has to question what the court's ruling is. Consequently, I don't see that third paragraph as incorporating anything other than what happened on February the 8th. 
Judge, I'm not saying, I don't think it does either. The other order wasn't, the other findings in the original order were not part of the compensatory award. That was not part of that. Well, but if that's the case, then this is a fairly significant modification of the early order, which would start the time running again. And I don't disagree that the February 8 is a modification of that first order. But now let's look at it this way. Now, we had a 14-day suspension order. The clock didn't start ticking for this order until January 25. Now you've got 21 days thereafter. That's going to bring us to February 15. In the interim, before the expiration of that 21 days and the court losing jurisdiction, I file my motion for remitted error. It's granted in part, denied in part. We get an order in that clearly is a modification, but only to the original order from the standpoint of Ms. Colson. That's the only modification. At that point in time, he still had, that is, the appellant, Ms. Colson, still had another week left on that order of suspension in the original 21 days to the 15th. Now what happens is that at that point in time, appellant files a motion for reconsideration with the trial court. In Fairfax, I don't have the option, I don't have the right to file an opposition unless the court instructs me to do that. I don't do that. The court then, on its own, denies that motion for reconsideration exclusively and only relating to the remitted punitive damage award, and then on February 28 enters what is referenced as an amended order, but then there's language at the very end of that order that says this is a final order. My position is that that part of that order is a complete nullity because the court's already lost jurisdiction concerning and relating to the compensatory awards, concerning and relating to the denial of the remitted error as it relates to Mr. Stemke, and by statute, there's no reason to put in any additional language about when the interest runs because... May I give you a scenario and you tell me what's wrong with it? Okay. Because obviously this is of great importance to both sides, all right? January 11, the order commemorates the jury verdict. Right. On that same day, there is a supplemental order that suspends that operation for 14 days, and as a result, the 21-day period begins not on the 11th but on the 25th. Correct. All right. Which means that it would expire on the 15th of February. Correct. You filed your motion for remitted error with a written brief attached. They had a response, and as a practice in Northern Virginia jurisdictions, you put it on the docket to get a ruling. Have to. So you go on February 8, well within the 21-day period that was set to expire on February 15th, and on February 8, the trial court rules on the motion for remitted error, and it is a significant modification of the earlier ruling. As a result, there's a new 21-day period that begins, and this new 21-day period would expire on February 29th just by math, and the parties tendered to the court an amended final order, which was entered on February 28th, one day before the new 21-day period would expire. Now, that's how I look at this case, and if that's the way it is, there's nothing wrong with the case before the court today. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that, Judge, is that when that order was entered on the 28th of February, the time had already expired. The trial court lost jurisdiction concerning and relating to the compensatory awards, the punitive award as it related to Mr. Stemke, and that issue of interest. I think what you're saying is that because those issues are divided, that all of the dates run separately. Well, but there was no, under Rule 1, colon 1, and under Rule 5, colon 5, there has to be a modification. There has to be a... But it says a modification of the order. It doesn't talk about the modification issue by issue. That's, I think, the difference between your view and mine. Yeah, I think that's where 
where, where we differ on that, Judge. I would say that that, that order concerns and relates to a, multiple, a, a multitude of various things. We're talking about two different plaintiffs. We're talking about two different <laughs> compensatory awards and, a, uh, and, and two punitive awards. Counsel, right. if, if paragraph 3 does refer to the January award, then is the February 28th award timely? Or the February 20, 28th order timely? Timely in, in reference to the punitive damage? In reference to everything. You said that the problem with the February 28th order is that it doesn't, the court has lost jurisdiction over the compensatory damage award, as I understand your argument. Compe the two compensatory awards and the punitive award as it relates to Mr. Uh, Stemke. But if the February 8th third paragraph incorporates the January order, right. then do they have 21 days from February 28th to make any changes to the order? No, because my position is the order of February 28th is not a modification, it's not, a, it's, it's not vacating, uh, nor is it suspending what the court has already uh, ruled on February 8th as it relates to what's been appealed in this case, which is the remitter as it relates to Ms. Colson. At that point in time, that, there's no, pursuant to Rule uh, 5, colon 5, there is no modification of the court's prior ruling. There is no modification, but the court still has jurisdiction of its order until the 29th. So why couldn't the court just amend its order? Well, it, it could, but it doesn't. It doesn't in this case. If, if we look, all the trial court is doing is basically reaffirming and restating the exact same thing it ruled and is embodied in the February uh, 8th uh, order, Counsel. the handwritten order. Counsel, on the 28th, the court said it's further adjudged in order that post-judgment interest shall run from the date of the verdict January 9th to the, at the rate specified in 6.2302. Is that in any of the prior orders? That is not in any of the other prior orders. Okay, so if, in fact, that was the only issue I objected to, Let's say, that for whatever reason, let's say I thought that it was supposed to be 18 percent interest dating back to a prior date. Right. That would be potentially thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of interest, dollars of interest. If I objected to that provision in the February 28th order, final order, amended final order as it's entitled, how many days would I have to file a notice of appeal on that? When, when would my deadline for filing a notice of appeal begin as to that? Well, I still think that when that order, uh, Justice Mims, was entered by the court on January 11, even though it didn't specifically set forth in that order that interest, post-judgment interest, was to run from this day uh, forward, I don't think you have to do that uh, pursuant to the statute. I think it's an uh, it's operation of law that when that final order is entered, as it relates to to the verdict, that that the interest was running. No one complained about when the date was going to uh, was going to start or accrue for the running of the interest. I think that's covered by statute. So that the order of February 28, even though the court says it's it's going to go back to January 11, I think, in all, in all candor, I don't think that was a necessary statement uh, or, or comment in that order. It didn't change anything. It still is the original order. I mean, no one was debating when the interest was running on all of these awards. The issue was whether or not that remitter uh, should have been granted. That's what the big dispute was at that, uh, at that particular time. I don't think that the February 28 order, and, and if I can just make myself clear, is that as it relates to the compensatory awards and as it, and as it relates to the punitive award of Mr. Stemke, the co-defendant or the co-plaintiff in this particular case, that, that the order of February 8 
uh, has no has no meaning to because it doesn't modify that previous order. It doesn't vacate it, nor does it suspend it. It just deals exclusively with the remitter. At that point in time, at that point in time, there was still seven days left on that order of suspension and the 21 days, which, as Justice Lemons has indicated, expires on February 15. At that point in time, the clock starts ticking for any appeal. When we go that 30 days as required under 5 colon 9, that expires on, by my calculation, that expires on the 18th of March. The notice of appeal was filed in Fairfax on March 21, three days. You answered okay, my Okay, thank you, Tom. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you didn't get any chance to talk about the, the case. Do you have questions? Uh, I'd like to ask if you have okay. an extended okay. time so you could talk about his sure. position on the case. <laughs> Whatever time you think is appropriate, five minutes or so. But I think five I, minutes. We took all his time. I, I just feel bad about that. All right. uh, uh, do you have any specific <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. If $100,000 is a, an appropriate punitive damage for one plaintiff in this case, right. why isn't it the appropriate punitive damage for the other plaintiff? Well, I, I think when we look at what this court has said and the five factors that it lays out very clearly uh, in Baldwin and Polston, that uh, these are the elements that need to be looked at. In this particular case, I would submit, and if we look closely at the transcript as to what the trial court did rule, it ruled three things as far as this remitted her. First, it said it was excessive. Uh, now, the excessiveness uh, of, that, of that award as it relates to Ms. Colson, he then went further and said that it, it was, there was a disparity, the disparity between what the compensatory award was against her and what that punitive award was against uh, her. So then thirdly, he said it wasn't proportional. It was out of proportion in the sense that the, that the compensatory award and the punitive award asked to Stemke uh, was, uh, I believe, about, about one to, or seven to one or a little over seven. Right. Whereas hers was about, one to 14 or so. Yeah, it was about 17. Well, I see, I would argue with you a little bit. It would look to me, despite what he said, that he made the decision solely on the proportionality. I mean, everything else is the same between these two plaintiffs. You got the same defendant, the same acts. Everything's the same except for the proportionality. If we look at if we look at what the trial court said, uh, starting at 10:39 uh, in uh, Appendix Two, I read it a couple times. Go ahead. Find out what you want to say. Uh, if we go to 10:40, uh, you know he he talks about. He talks about the fact that, uh, oh, right here, at the end of, uh, bottom of 1039. And one of the things that is troubling to me is that there is a significant disparity between the compensatory damage award for one plaintiff and the compensatory damage award for the other plaintiff. You think that implicates more than proportionality? Because yes. on 1041 he says, but on the evidence before me, and in particular considering the proportionality between the compensatory and punitive awards, that's what he says. So he's looking at the ratio again. Well, I, it, it, it's, you know, again, it's, very, it's a little difficult. I, I, the way I understood it when, when, when the trial court was making its ruling, he was talking about, number one, that disparity. The disparity as set forth in one of the fine fact, in one of the five factors saying that it's the reasonableness between the compensatory award and the punitive award, factor one. Then, I, then the way I interpret it is, is that he then goes on further uh, and he says, and he talks about the fact that the award was excessive. Uh, that, I, I, I would say, goes into uh, factor two. The measurement of punishment is required was excessive as it related to Mr. Canchola for the Colson case. So, th so what you're saying is, the punishment is related not only to just the bad acts of the defendant, but also how badly the plaintiff was hurt. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I, th okay. I, I, think, I think when we look at those factors, clearly this court has said on several occasions that, uh, you know, that it's, you're looking at the amount of damage, harm, or injury done. In this case, both of these plaintiffs, fortunately, uh, had soft tissue strains. These, this was not 
uh, a major case in, the, in regards to compensatory damages. But then the last thing the trial court says, and the third element that it talks about, is this proportionality issue. And what was troubling to the trial court was was when you look at all five factors, now all five didn't apply in this particular case, but when you look at the ones that did apply, he was troubled by the fact that there was this disparity between compensatory and punitive damages between the two plaintiffs, uh, and that that certainly had a bearing. And I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you fully that that troubled the trial court uh, and uh, I would say that the majority of his decision was based on the proportionality. However, not exclusively. In fact, he thought we were going to reverse it if he, if he didn't uh, lower it. He thought we were going to reverse it if he didn't lower it. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, he made that comment right yeah. you know, that day in court, that, that okay. if I don't, if I don't uh, remit this, that I'm going to get reversed. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. I appreciate the additional You're time. welcome. Thank you. Since you had about 55 seconds left, so we'll, we'll be fair and give you five minutes, too. Oh, I'm not going to need it, Your Honor. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'll still give it to you. <laughs> you don't have, to, you don't have to use it, though. It'll be fine if you don't. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I think it's pretty clear, uh, again, looking back from page one, 1039 to 1041, that proportionality is, and the ratio is what's guided uh, the trial court's ruling. I mean, the, the court says the Colson Award I find to be excessive, and I remitted that to $50,000, which is less than a 10% uh, ratio. And then the court goes on to say the Stemke Award is fine because it's under 1 to 10. Um, and again, ultimately, there's no bright line rule that the court has uh, established. And to answer your question, and Mr. Brankoff, I agree with him here on, on the point of, of course you can consider the compensatories and the damages that are sustained. It's part of the, the analysis, but you just can't look at one and not the others. You've got to look at the other factors, and you got to look at the conduct, and this is really, the conduct is very, very, as you can, trial record is In fact, clear. the ratio he set up on the one he remitted is about the same as the ratio on, on the one he approved, right? Didn't he make the ratios about the same? Yeah, one is one to ten, while the other one, I think, less it was, actually it's even less than one to ten. Less this than one to ten. This court has one to ten. If it was up to ten, it should have been even more specific in 55,600. So yep. <laughs> we've lost that there's 5,600 there. But uh, there's no question that this court has said you can consider the, the bodily injury. And when it, com when, it, when it comes to sort of looking at the ratio and applying the ratio analysis, but it's not dispositive in itself. And the court's focus on that and not really looking at the, the, the sort of terrible, egregious conduct, I think, is the problem with the decision. And if you apply the other four factors, I think, and, and, and again, you don't apply excessive if you don't apply just a bright line rule, which I don't think the court has done in its prior cases as for a 1 to 10 ratio, I think it has to come out in our favor. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you. The court will take a short recess. All right.